Welcome back. In the first half, we ended by asking, what will you prioritize and pursue in your life? Otherwise, known as where do I get to my priorities? And I said, if you get that one wrong, really, you're, you're going to struggle to be on the right path. And looking at the world, looking at media, looking at movies, commercials, you get the wrong view of how to look at your life. You really can't come up with good priorities from anything other than God and His Word. Well, I think a lot of people in the world, they make their priorities wrong, but there are some truths that we see that maybe affect the way we look at our priorities. Uh, Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said, as a longtime student of this fascinating field, life and time management, I am personally persuaded that the essence of the best thinking in the area of time management can be captured in a single phrase, organize and execute around priorities. <laughs> that is absolutely true. <laughs> that is essentially what I am telling you. You have to know what your priorities are, biblically, what God says that they are, and then you organize your life, plan around these priorities that God has given you, and then you act on them. That would be the execute. So you plan and act on the priorities that God has given you. I think that is the essential core of the Christian life. The essence of the Christian life is planning to do what God said. <laughs> That's essentially what he said, only leaving God out of it. Plan to do what God said and act on what God said. Now, again, we go back to if you start with the wrong priorities, you're never going to end up in the right place. So I'm going to give you three priorities that I think you might disagree somewhat with two and three as far as where they are on your list. The number one, I think, is a non-negotiable. The other two, I think, have to be very, very high on your list of priorities. There, obviously, all of us, we live different lives. We have different um, gifts, different roles, even within uh, the church and the spiritual life. So you're going to have some slight variations in even your your top five to ten priorities. But when you get to the top, there's, there's a few things that I think all of us have to understand. This is somewhere on my I'm planning for and acting out these priorities. And the first one is actually the one we've already mentioned. God must be first. <clears throat> that is a, a non-negotiable. We looked at that in, in several different ways already. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I mean, that's, that's not great. In Matthew 22, 35, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Again, that's not great. That's, that's all. It's everything. Deuteronomy 6, um, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Again, that's all. Heart, soul, mind, strength. That's not great that you pursue God, put God absolutely first. And what that looks like then is a life that is that Romans 12 living sacrifice. My life is dedicated to Him so, God must be first. Um, Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, as God is clarifying these commandments for the children of Israel, He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What does He say? You shall have no other gods before me. God must be first. God and God alone. Luke 10, we looked at Mary and Martha. Serving is good. There is absolutely a place for serving. We are, we are commanded to serve each other. However, God clearly has to be in the first place. And as we go on, we'll look more at what that actually looks like in our life. But understand you can't leave it as a vague, well, I want to put God first. We're today sticking with the, the bigger picture of what are these big priorities, not how they work out in life as much. 
But it's important to recognize that when I say, I want God to be first in my life, part of what that means is that I'm actually going to make choices that consistently put God first. I'm going to prioritize God and His will, obedience to Him, above personal comfort, personal safety, a lot of the issues that we feel are important. I'm going to put God above my family. Hey, we don't like to think that. I'm going to put family first. Well, no. God has to be first. That has worked out in your choices. In some little ways, I don't know if it's, I, these are not even little, they're time use choices. It's, it's worked out when I choose to get up and read my Bible rather than sleep in and rush out the door to work. It's in the choice to spend some of my lunch break praying for people in my family, for coworkers, for neighbors, uh, for my church. I just talking about my own life instead of scrolling through Instagram. You say, well, those are little choices. That's where God has to win. He has to be first in those. And I think it's in those little choices that we build the foundation that allows us to consistently choose God in the other ones. I mean, if you're not day-to-day putting God first in the little things, you're probably going to have a struggle every time, in every area, when it comes to choosing God. He has to be first in everything. So what does that look like? And that's, that's kind of where I want you to get, to look at your life. Sunday to Saturday, you have a full week. Every day, uh, you have a different schedule. Some days you have a, a very clear schedule. Some days are more free, free form. But every day you're making choices. You're doing things. What does it look like to put God first? What are the things that you need to put in your life to help you put God first? You know, I've mentioned some of these things before that you know you can prepare today and make it easier for you to serve tomorrow. You can prepare today and make it easier for you to make the right choice tomorrow. One example of that that I use all the time is like in running. You know, I have gone through huge periods in my life where I'm running consistently and I don't always enjoy running. It's not my favorite thing. It's, it's, it's great for you. It's a good choice. Uh, it's good exercise. It's cheap. It works great for exercise and staying in shape. But it's hard to do, particularly in those times of life when I have to get up early in the morning to run. I really don't like that. In the winter, it's cold, it's dark, it's time to run. Okay, I hate running at that point in time, right? So it's really important, then if I'm committed to it, that I prepare the day before. I prepare the day before by making sure my shoes and my socks are ready to go. They're, they're out. My socks are sitting on top of my shoes. They're ready to go. Beside my bed, I need my running clothes. I need my running gear. If it's, if it's cold, I'm anticipating cold, so I may have you know, three layers that I'm planning to wear, but they're right there. So the easiest thing to do in the morning is to get up and put on my running gear, not to get up and do something else. If I have to make it easy, I have to have my watch right there ready to go. I have to have my gloves, stocking cap. I mean, it's cold. It's got to be ready. I have that ready to go. And I have a plan. I know how far I'm supposed to run. And usually when I'm really consistent like that and I'm planning to run even on those times when the weather's not good, it means I'm preparing for something. I'm planning to run a marathon or a longer run with other people. So I have a goal in mind. So my goal gives me the plan for the day. I know how far I'm supposed to run or how long. 
I make it easy for myself to get up in the morning and go, well, ah, it's cold, but there's my stuff. I've already got the plan. My, my one plug went off at the right time, so I'm, I have time to do it. Okay, it's much easier then to get up and do it. Then if I don't make those choices the day before, those are little choices, but imagine when you don't make those choices, and you can make some terrible choices. What if I don't set my alarm at all? I just say, oh, I'll get up. I usually get up when it gets light, so I'll, I'll get up. And I don't get my running gear out, so it's in a drawer, who knows where, my running shoes maybe are still in the back porch from the last time I ran. My running gear's where, it's scattered. Okay, now I get up, and it's cold, so I'm gonna put something on. And you put something on that's warm, and now you're warm, and you got started moving, and you're looking for running stuff, and it's cold outside. Maybe you didn't get up on time because you were, didn't set the alarm. So I, I made it hard. All these little choices made it harder for me to do what I want to do, what I've committed to do. What does that look like in your spiritual life? Well, for me, it means I have a stack of books that are part of my daily morning devotions. So I have a notebook. I really encourage journaling. I have a, a journal. I have two Bibles, actually, because I have one that I do my journaling out of consistently, and I have another one that I'm, I read through different translations of the Bible every a year or so, so I have one that I'm just reading through. So I, I read through uh, three to five chapters a day in that, that translation. And then I usually have one to three other books where I'm maybe reading a chapter or two a day. And I don't, I don't put those at the top of the list. Those are at the bottom of the list. So if I run out of time, I'm going to do my journal. I'm going to read uh, my reading. And that's kind of the minimum. Above that, then you have more study and doing the other reading. Although, really, I, when I'm talking about this, my morning devotions, that's not my study time. So that reading is... Uh, not prepared me for something. I may use that, and a lot of times the books that I'm reading, they are something that I want to study, I want to learn, <clears throat> I want to apply in ministry, but I'm not specifically reading those with a, uh, a notebook planning to do something with that. But I've got those things together, and they're, they're all together and they're ready to go every day. I have a pen, I have a highlighter, I have my Bibles, I have those other books. I have my glasses sitting there on top of them. I have a space carved out in the house where I can sit and have enough light to read even though nobody else is going to be awake. So those little choices mean that I'm very consistent in spending that time in God's Word. I keep the Wednesday night, we have a prayer bulletin, I try to keep that in my journal so that after I write in my journal, I open the prayer bulletin and I kind of go through some of the key prayer requests in there, people in the church. I can be very consistent because of the little choices. If I didn't do that, if I didn't have a plan for what I'm going to read, I didn't have all those books together, it would be much harder once I get up and you get started doing something. After a certain point of the day, it's really hard for me to go back and carve out that time again. Take that through all of life. How do you set yourself up to succeed spiritually? How do you make little choices? that help you to grow. I think that's all part of putting God first. Okay, I have two other things that I really want to get to today that I consider these non-negotiables as far as our priorities. If you're going to plan and act out your priorities, then one of the key things you have to understand is that your character counts. God is really concerned about your character. And there's a just a pile of verses old in the New Testament that talk about how much God cares about your heart, about your your mind, your thought processes, about who you are. Uh, Romans 5, 3 to 5, actually 1 to 5, says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So here we see that we have uh, this emphasis on character. 
So tribulations, trials, are important. <laughs> I just is kind of a side note, but it says we glory in tribu- tribulations. I mean, you give thanks for tribulations because they do something. They produce something. Perseverance and character and hope. So our character comes from having to do hard things. That's one of the things that you know, I've tried to work with our kids and help them understand. You don't build strong character by doing nothing. You don't build strong character by taking the easy path. You don't build strong character by doing whatever you want to do. Uh, strong character is built by doing the right thing even when it's hard. Doing the right thing when it hurts. Doing the right thing when it's not best for you, but it's best for somebody else. You have to persevere in that. And persevering and doing the right thing, even when it's difficult, changes your character. And as our character changes, and we recognize that a lot of the choices we make that develop our character are made because of who God is. And as our understanding of who God is grows, our hope grows. And then this verse ends, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So all of this is the work of the Holy Spirit and this work of transformation that we keep talking about. Our character is part of that work of transformation that the Holy Spirit does. And tribulations are part of that process in our life. Now we can go on and look at some of the different aspects of our character that God really cares about, I think. Galatians 5, 22 to 26 is, is really key. It really helps us understand the kind of person that God is changing you into. And you know that God is doing it because this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is not the fruit of your hard work. This is fruit that results from the Holy Spirit's work in your life. And I think hand in hand with that, as you understand the kind of person that God is growing you in, into, then your choices should line up with that. I should desire to be that person. So the Holy Spirit is working these things out in me, and I'm also doing my best to choose those things because I understand God wants me to be this kind of person. So Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, now, think about all of those in terms of your character. I mean, the person who consistently lives those things out in their life, they're going to have a good character. That's going to be a person you're going to want to be around. That's going to be a person that you can trust. That's going to be a person that you want to work with. That's going to be a person that's going to be a joy to go through hardship with. So I want my life to exhibit those characters. I want to love people as Jesus loved people. And let me tell you, I don't. I know that I don't, but also I understand that the Spirit is moving me in that direction. I love people more than I used to. I'm changing. That's part of that work of transformation. I have more joy than I used to. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit as God works in me. But I'm also seeking to be joyful. I'm also seeking to live that life of thanksgiving, that leads to joy. I don't have perfect peace, but I have more peace than I had before. I'm growing in my ability to have peace in every situation. I'm seeking peace, and I understand that what God wants me to have is peace in my character, in my mind, even though I may not have peace in my circumstances. I'm seeking to grow in long-suffering, in my ability to have patience and perseverance and bear out well in difficulties. I know that the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. God is working that in me, and I'm choosing that myself to keep my eyes on Christ, not on my situation. I'm seeking to be kind, good, faithful, gentle, and to have true self-control. I'm seeking those, and I understand the Holy Spirit is working in me to develop me into that kind of person, but I'm choosing those. I'm trying to set my life up 
to remind me that this is the better choice. Verse 25 there says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's my goal, is to walk very very much in line with the work the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. That's not always easy, but that is the choice I'm trying to make. And I try to set myself up to make those small choices well. I think that's part of the importance of meditating on and memorizing Scripture. By meditating on verses like this here in Galatians and thinking about what it means to really be kind. What does that look like? How how, how are you kind in every area of your life with every person in your life? What does it look like to be kind to the waitress who serves you when you have lunch? What does that mean? What does it mean to be kind to uh, the jerk that just cut you off as you're going to, to work in heavy traffic? What does kindness look like there? Because it still should apply. Well, I think spending time meditating on verses like this, meditating on the fruit of the Spirit, and, and really considering what it means to be this kind of person, that's part of this process of transportation of transformation, how we uh, work this truth into our life. So, short form, God's going to be first, and our character really matters to God. Character counts. And then the last one that I really want to emphasize, if you have three priorities, these have to be on there. God has to be first. Your character has to be something that you're pursuing, you're really desiring to be Christ-like, pursuing godliness, righteousness, as Paul challenged Timothy. Then the last one, your relationships matter. You, you have to place a high priority on relationships. It's just critical. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but go back and look at 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 11. And the Corinthian church just was, you know, it was just a disaster. I mean, it was uh, just, you can't even imagine how bad some of the things seem to be in this church. But they're still, they're called saints, they're still called brothers. But he talks to them here in chapter 6 and saying, you know, they're apparently taking each other to court and suing each other and having um, conflicts that they cannot resolve themselves. And verse 7 then to me is a key verse in this. As he's challenging, he said, I I can't believe that. Is there not a wise man among you, he says in verse 5, who can judge? He says, I can't believe in verse 6 that you're, you're... going to court against brothers in the church, and the judge is not a believer. So, verse 7 says, Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Think about that. It is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Think about that. Paul is saying that our relationship and our testimony, in particular here, our testimony to the outside world, is so critical, so important. How do you not accept wrong rather than go to court against each other? I mean, you just you can't even imagine how much importance that Jesus, that Paul, that God places on our relationships. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 3 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, this is really... A, an idea that comes back often that we walk worthy, means the life we live should be worthy of the calling we've been given. God called us now to seek to follow Him, seek to act like Him. And part of that lowliness and gentleness we see in Philippians chapter 2, uh, with long suffering, bearing with one another. And this, that's what they were not doing in Corinthians. They weren't bearing with one another, they were taking each other to court. So instead of 
really striving to keep unity, uh, they were being divisive in poor testimony and harming their relationships. Romans 12, 9 to 21, again, is another passage that just talks a lot about our relationships. It's just so important that we, uh, oh, we are kind of affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, keeping preference to one another. This is something I come back to a lot. We're to consider others better than ourselves, to give preference to one another. I don't have to get what I want. I'm willing to do what's best for you, and that's difficult for us. I mean, we struggle in that. I mean, Philippians 2, 1 to 4 is the passage that really uh, emphasizes that again. It says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. God first, God first in us, and God first in our relationships. That's that's the bottom line. How is that working out in your life? I mean, that's that's the thing, right? We want to put God first in every area, in every relationship, and everything, but it's it's a struggle to do that day in and day out to consistently pursue God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thanks for joining me. Let me know how you're doing. Write me at Norman at RomanCourses.net. It's difficult, but keep, keep running. In 1925, it seemed to some like Christianity itself was under fire. The Scopes Monkey Trial was broadcast all over the country, a debate over teaching evolution in public schools. To some, this was a lone man standing against the tide of atheism. To others, fundamentalism run amok. In reality, it turns out we're all getting it wrong. This season on the Truce Podcast, we're digging into the history of Christian fundamentalism, from the beginning of evangelicalism to this courthouse in rural Tennessee. Along the way, we'll talk to historians like George Marsden, Joel Carpenter, Michael Kazin, and Kevin Belmonte. And I have a fascinating chat with Jacob Goldstein, co-host of the Planet Money Podcast. Subscribe to Truce wherever you get your podcasts or visit trucepodcast.com. 